construct a dilemma, a rule of inference. If P then Q, and if R then S, either P or R, therefore, either Q or S. Above the line in this rule of inference are premises, and below it, the conclusion that they entail. Sometimes you might see this rule written with three premises, though we will usually use just the two. This rule is about knowing that there are two possible paths ahead of you and thinking about their consequences. Here we have a path from P that leads down to Q and a path from R that leads down to S. We know we're going down one of those paths, so we know we're going to get one of those results. Of course, because of the nature of OR, the paths aren't mutually exclusive. This is the kind of thinking you do when you don't know which thing is going to happen, so you consider the possible results of both. We can sub in A, B, C, and D for P, Q, R, and S, and we get if A then B, and if C then D, A or C, therefore, B or D. Since A leads to B and C leads to D, you know that you're going to be ending up at either B or D since you know you're going to be starting with either A or C. Of course, again, you could end up in all of those places. You might find it more instructive to use somewhat more complicated inputs. Let's do not A for P, B and C for Q, either D or A for R, and if B, then not D for S. And you're going to get a huge mess. However, constructive dilemma is going to help you sort out that mess and see the connections between the things a little bit more clearly. Note our main conditionals, ampersand, and two Vs. In the first line, the next sub the next sub operators are arrows. This rule form tells us that despite how messy this is, we know that not A is going to lead you to B and C and that either D or A is going to lead you to if B, then not D. We also know that you're choosing between those two beginnings, not A and either D or A, so you're going to get one of those two endings. We haven't made, it, made the whole thing that much easier, but what we have done is figuring out which things are connected to which. This rule form is pretty complicated, so this might be a good slide to pause and take some notes at. The main operator is going to be an ampersand with arrows on each side, as well as a V, both for one premise and for the conclusion. This never applies to any lines without that exact combination of main operators. The rule of inference only applies to whole lines and it only goes in one direction. You certainly can't get all of this information out of Q or S alone. It always cites exactly one conjunction of conditionals and one disjunction, and it results in another disjunction. The disjuncts, either side of the V in the premise, must be the antecedents of the conditionals in the next premise. The disjuncts in the conclusion are the consequence of the conditionals in the conjunction. This is going to make hopefully a lot more sense when we translate it into everyday life because you really do use constructive dilemma all the time. That's why it's one of our rules, even though it's so complicated. So imagine you're going to a restaurant and you're trying to decide what to order. For P, we'll say, I order barbecue wings. For Q, my face will be covered in barbecue sauce. For R, I order salad. For S, I can eat with dignity. That gives us a very useful constructive dilemma. If I order barbecue wings, then my face will be covered in barbecue sauce. But if I order salad, then I can eat with dignity. Either I order barbecue wings or I order salad. So either my face will be covered in barbecue sauce or I can eat with dignity. This argument doesn't tell me what to do, but it lays out the consequences of my possible decisions. If I'm at a business lunch or going on a date, I should consider the salad. If I'm eating alone, maybe I'll order the barbecue wings. You might have used a constructive dilemma when thinking about whether or not to do this class. P, classes online. Q, there will be take home quizzes. R, classes in person. S, there will be an in-person final exam. 
If class is online, then there will be take-home quizzes, but if class is in person, there will be an in-person final exam. Either class is online or it is in person, so there will either be take-home quizzes or an in-person final exam. Depending on what kind of examination or quiz you prefer, you that might have had a an input on your choice of online or in-person class. Finally, these are pretty useful when voting. Let's say if candidate A wins the election, then policies X, Y, and Z will be pursued. And if candidate B wins the election, policies P, Q, and R will be pursued. Either candidate A or B will win the election. Perhaps no one else is running. So either policies X, Y, and Z, or P, Q, and R would be pursued. If you think of it that way, this set of policies versus that set of policies, you can strip away some of the things that you may not care about when it comes to deciding who to vote for. Hopefully constructive dilemmas are things that you find helpful. It'll be instructive to definitely not do the truth table for constructive dilemma. In fact, Constructive dilemma, and even more complicated reasoning like it, is why we have natural deduction in the first place. Well, that, and that's how we actually think. But no one wants to do a truth table with this many cells. Not me, and not you, not in this video, and not ever. Let's skip straight on to how to use this in a proof. If P then Q, if R then S, and either R or P, therefore, either S or Q. Well, let's simplify out if R then S, and let's simplify out either R or P. Now we'll go ahead and conjoin our two conditionals and get if R then S and if P then Q. Now we can get either S or Q, our conclusion, by a constructive dilemma. And how about in an even more complicated case? If P then Q and if Q then R. If not S, then either not T or U. If P or not S, and if R, then W. Therefore, either W or not T or U. I'll be honest, this is a pretty hard proof, but this is a good time to see not only how to use constructive dilemma, but also how to work backwards from the conclusion to make hard proofs a little bit simpler and more doable. So let's go ahead and notice not S. Not S is sitting right there as the antecedent of a conditional and as one side of a disjunct. That is a sign of constructive dilemma. Let's see if we can find any others. Well, the consequent of not S is conditional, either not T or U, is right there as a disjunct in the conclusion. We should definitely be looking for a constructive dilemma based on the other disjunct of our conclusion, W. Sure enough, it shows up elsewhere in the proof in line 3. In fact, line 3 is where we also see not S's disjunction. On the other side of it is P. If we can find a connection between W and P, we'll be able to use constructive dilemma and cut through a potentially a lot of work. If we know our hypothetical syllogism, then we can, because we'll be able to go from P to Q to R to W. We'll be able to put together the conditional if P then W, and from there, we'll be very close to having our constructive dilemma. So let's see the steps in order. First, we'll simplify line one. Then we'll simplify line three. It's always good to do all of your simplifications right away. Well, almost always good. In this case, it certainly is. Then we can do our first hypothetical syllogism from if P to R with lines four and five. We could have done that right away if we wanted to. Then we do our next hypothetical syllogism. We go from P to W, and now we're almost there. We're just going to put lines nine and ten, to, lines two and nine together into a conjunction so that it's ready for the constructive dilemma. And there we have it. We've got P, we've got not S, and those will lead us to the choice between either W or either not T or U. That didn't end up being that hard. Constructive dilemma was the only really difficult rule we needed to use, and given all the information we processed, doing this in only 11 lines is pretty good. 
constructive dilemma is as powerful in regular logic as it is in your real life. Which brings us to the main error with constructive dilemma, not using it. It looks complicated, and indeed it is, but we all already use this rule in our heads multiple times a day, every day. Humans are pretty smart, it turns out. Whether you're ordering food and thinking about the consequences, whether you're voting and thinking about the policies the candidates support, or whether you're thinking about which class to take and what kind of exam you're going to have to face at the end of it, you're probably using some constructive dilemmas. Because this one rule does so much work in symbolic logic, it might save you quite a few steps in a proof. So don't be intimidated. Take the time to learn how to use constructive dilemma, and you'll get your time back on the homework and in the quizzes later on.